Apple Knocker Radio. Greetings, friends. My guest today is author, astrologer, and druid John Michael Greer. Today we discuss his recently released book, The Twilight of Pluto, which has a singularly fascinating thesis and a singularly intriguing way of making sense of our modern madness. The Twilight of Pluto is as interesting a book as I've read in a long time, and I read a lot of books. It has single-handedly inspired me to delve more deeply into astrology, specifically mundane astrology, which I find far more interesting than the usual horoscope and birth chart kind of stuff. Perhaps that's because my personal time of birth has been lost to the dustbin of history, rendering me incapable of getting a proper birth chart done. Really, though, I think I'm just a big-picture guy who digs big-picture perspectives. So, mundane astrology is the way for me. One can never be quite certain what to expect when talking to professional druids, astrologers, and occultists. They are by nature outsiders, or heretics, as Greer likes to say. Outsiders are my tribe, so there's no problem there. But working in the weird sphere, I've noticed a great deal of egomaniacs in these fringe spiritual spaces. That probably makes sense, really, because only people with strong senses of self are willing or capable of living outside the herd. With Greer, though, that wasn't an issue. He's a down-to-earth guy. He's humble, practical, relaxed, and fun to talk with. Where I come from, we'd call him a just plain good dude. I enjoyed the conversation immensely and hope that it wakes a lot of people up to Greer's utterly fascinating thesis and perspective on our current chaotic times. So, with no further ado, here is John Michael Greer discussing his recent work, The Twilight of Pluto. Uh, the book the book was just extremely uh, really powerful for me and uh, really helpful for me in these, you know, in these crazy times that we're living in. So I, I thought that would be a good way to start because the thing that I found so um, you know, pacifying about it was the big picture idea of this, this current era as part of a larger scope of time and the role that Pluto has played. So I was hoping if we could start with your, you discussing the broader thesis of the book before we get into Pluto specifically. Sure. Okay. Okay, so the basic idea of, of the Twilight of Pluto, the framing concept, is that astrological events are the, are the indicators of changes in human history and collective consciousness. Of course, they indicate other things as well. Um, but, but we can, by watching things going on in the heavens and by watching the way human beings respond to things going on in the heavens, we can get a certain amount of perspective on what's going on um, in the world. This is part of the branch of astrology called mundane astrology, which doesn't get as much attention nowadays as some. It's not about personalities. It's about nations. It's about cultures. It's about um, the rise and fall of ideas and the rise and fall of, of basic themes in, in human society and human activity. So this, this, is, this is something that has been going on, of course, for a very long time. Um, Probably, as far as we know, people dis first discovered the, the planets as distinct from the sun and moon um, something like 6,000 years ago. And that's, a, of course, that's a subject we can get into um, as we continue the discussion. But it is, it is interesting that right about the time that the planets were identified as se something separate from the stars, not just another set of stars, but these, these little disks that were moving across the sky in their own patterns, that's about the same time that each of the things those planet rule, those planets rule, came into being. We have um, more or less all at once. We have the rise of, of agriculture, which is Saturn. We have the rise originally a rise of gardening, um, because that that preceded field agricultural, of course. Hmm. That's Venus. Um, a lot of basic crafts, pottery is a Venus thing, weaving is a Venus thing, and all these things sort of popped into being. And then you have. And of um, of architecture beyond the sort of, of um, tribal hut level, um, that's also Saturn. You have the emergence of governments and of established religions. That's Jupiter. You have warfare. That's Mars. And so, and then of course you have writing. You have um, various other forms of communication. You have the beginnings of written culture. That's all Mercury. So as those planets were discovered. These corresponding factors in human society popped into being. And so, those, of course, those five planets, plus the sun and moon, were what people knew about until, what was it, 1781. 1781, there is um, George Herschel staring through, a, um, through his telescope, through one of the best new telescopes in the world, and he sees 
raise what ought to be a star, except it's not. It's too big. It has a disk. No matter how, what kind of telescope you're using, by the way, I don't know how many of our listeners have done have done astronomy and actually looked for telescopes. It's a really big pair of telescope. Stars are little dots. They do not become disks. They're not close enough. Hmm. But so here he was staring through his big new reflector telescope, and there's this little pale disk. Puts on a new eyepiece to give him more powerful. The disk gets larger. Put on yet another eyepiece to make the, the, the little powerful eyepiece he had. The disk gets larger still. Okay, it's got to be something. Is it a comet? Well, it doesn't seem like one. It doesn't change. It doesn't move the way comets move. It moves the way a planet moves. And you've got to understand, this was totally revolutionary. This is beyond revolutionary. Right. Everyone knew there were just five planets plus the sun. Look, except here there was a sixth. There it is. And there was some discussion as to what, what to, to call it. Some people wanted to name it after him, and we're kind of lucky that we didn't end up with the planet Herschel. <laughs> but, um, but we didn't. They, they named it Uranus after the, the Titan who was the father of Saturn. You know, since Saturn was the father of Jupiter, so Uranus was the father of Saturn. Okay, that makes sense. And everyone just had to get used to the fact that there was another planet. Now, Uranus, as, we, as astrologers have since figured out, um, and this, this is a long, slow process, of course. We don't just go, ooh, there's a new planet. I, I'll decide that it means this, this, and it. No, that, you don't do good astrology that way. You do good astrology by saying, okay, here's a new planet. Let's look at how it appears in charts. Let's look at natal charts. Let's look at horary charts. Let's look at mundane charts for nations. What does it do? What does it affect? It's squaring Mars. What does that mean? It's trining Venus. What does that mean? And over a period of decades, or in some cases centuries, gradually you piece together, okay, that's what Uranus means. That's what this new planet, this newly discovered planet tells us. And Uranus is the planet of revolutions. This is the planet of technology. It's the planet of sudden abrupt change. It's the planet of weirdness. It is the planet of countercultures. Also of um sexual variation. It's, um, that's, it is the planet, among other things, of homosexuality. And so here's the thing that's interesting, because right about the time it was discovered and extending for a, a period before and a period after, all of these things came boiling up. We had the Industrial Revolution. We had the American Revolution. We had the French Revolution. We had the first strings of electrical technology. Electricity is very Uranian. We had the first movements toward the, rec- the, the idea that um, gay and lesbian people should be recognized as having a separate sexual identity rather than just being considered, oh yeah, there are people who do funny things, okay? Um, you have the emergence of, of certain kinds of countercultures. You have um, the first stirrings of science fiction, hmm. another very Uranian thing. All of this comes boiling up. Now, this does not mean that George Herschel caused this to happen by spotting of Uranus, quite the contrary, it's the other way around. Uranus was discovered when it was right, when it was the right time for these influences to come into being. Hmm. Uranus, in effect, showed himself. He said, oh, hi there, Mr. Herschel, here I am. <laughs> was he, was he, I'm sorry to interrupt, but was he um, influencing things before his discovery, or did his influence begin at his discovery? Um, generally speaking, the influence of a new planet starts one Saturn cycle, about 30 years, before the planet itself is discovered. Okay. Oh, that's, that's right. That's in the book. It. Yeah, that's in the book. So in the, in, the, um, in the course of from the 1760s to the 1790s, you can watch all these revolutionary things starting to stir, but they really hit their stride at the time of the discovery and immediately thereafter. So you've got that sort of lead-in period. With Uranus, it kind of landed with a boom, because Uranus is that kind of planet. Uranus is not, is not subtle, is not gentle, is not evasive. He shows, he, he kicks down the door. And so, so a lot of things happen very quickly once he was discovered. Hmm. So we have that. So there are six planets. And of course, at that, at that point, our astronomers were going, oh boy, what if there are other ones out there? Hmm. So people start searching. We'll get into uh, one of the things that happened, the discovery of Ceres and the asteroids in the middle. But the next the next full real planet that was discovered, of course, was Neptune. And that was the same kind of thing. Um, it was a little subtler because it wasn't just somebody staring out of it out, out through a telescope into a particular corner of the sky. People noted that the math didn't work. 
Uranus, the movements of Uranus had they were a little fast in some places, a little slow in others. It just didn't work right. And so mathematicians went to work on this and said, oh, there may be another planet out there affecting Uranus by its gravity. So there's this hidden force causing things to slosh back and forth. Keep that in mind as we go. 1846 comes around. Two different scientists, unbeknown to each other, calculate out where this, this um, other planet might be. Two different teams of astronomers try to find it. One of, them, one of them gets there first. After a long series of miscommunications and confusions and um, dropped letters and clues that didn't get picked up on, this is also important. That's Neptune. And when people spotted Neptune, the astronomers, all the, you know, one, once it had been seen, everybody zoomed in on the telescopes. There's this blue disk, you know, very, very far out. And so it got its name because it's blue. It's kind of ocean colored. Okay, but as astrologers got to work on your on Neptune, rather, they figured out this is a very different kind of planet. This planet is evasive. This planet is mysterious, cloudy. We don't. It's very difficult to trace what's going on. Where Uranus kicks down the door, Neptune kind of filters in without anyone quite knowing what he's up to. Um, he is the planet of, where, where, where Uranus is the planet of science fiction, Neptune is the planet of fantasy. Hmm. Neptune is a planet of drug abuse. It was after Neptune's discovery that people were going, whoa, drugs. And he's the planet of, of insanity. He's the planet of certain kinds of creativity. He's the planet of illusion and delusion, but also of unity, of, of mystical experience. And all of these things started becoming social forces, becoming significant factors after Neptune was discovered. And again, there's that 30-year lead time in. You can watch the invention of modern fantasy fiction. You can hmm. watch you know, the emergence of interesting dreams and all these other Neptunian factors. And you can also watch the emergence of a very different political style because Uranus had a political style. We saw it in the, year, in the American Revolution. We saw it in the French Revolution. It was all about the rights of the individual. But 1846 comes around, Neptune is discovered, and we start seeing collectivist ideologies. We start seeing the politics of groups and classes and masses. The Communist Manifesto was written two years after Neptune was discovered. Hmm. So you have this idea of unities, whether real unities or fake unities or, or imaginary unities, and it just kind of goes from there. So that gives us sort of a, a broad picture of what was, with, with certain exceptions we'll get into in a moment, that's sort of the broad picture that feeds into the discovery of Pluto in 1930. Is this, um, John, a quick question. Is this an, an aspect of what you refer to it as mundane, mundane astrology? Um, but I've never actually heard this idea of planets arising um, when when it's their time to influence human uh, consciousness. So is that an insight that you had recently, or is that a part of mundane astrology? It's something that's been being talked about and thought about in, the, in certain corners of the astrological community for okay. um, about a century now. Um, Richard Tarnas did a very good book called Cosmos and Psyche, where he talks at great length about this. That was in, what, a few decades ago, I think that came out. Um, before him, Carl Jung, the psychologist, who was also, by the way, a crackerjack astrologer, he used to guide his treatment by casting horoscopes of his patients. Huh. Um, you know, the, the official types will not admit that, but, uh, but you can find the documentation easy enough. He was a really good astrologer. And he was very attentive to things like that. The discovery, he saw the discovery of a new planet as being, in his term, the constellation of a new psychic dominant, a new a new um, energy in the human psyche. And so he talked about that. I don't actually know how far back it goes, but I originally got the idea from Jung. Hmm. And then I read Richard Tarnas' book that I just mentioned and was, was reading that going, wow, this is really good. Yeah, that, this, the concept <laughs> is amazing, man. It's amazing to me. But yeah, so there's, so, so it's not, classical mundane astrology didn't really get into that. Um, classical mundane astrology mostly works with um, ingress charts for the, for the four seasons of the year, works with foundation charts for when a nation or a city or what have you is discovered, works with eclipses, and, um, but also with supernovas. And I think uh, one of the reasons that some astrologers have been able to, to get into this notion of planets is when a supernova happens, or a comet, anything new pops up in the heavens, that's important. That's something that tells you that things are, things are changing. 
Hmm. And so the same logic applies to planets, except, of course, a comet goes, zooms by and off into, you know, the outer darkness. A supernova, boom, it's there and it fades out, it's gone. A planet, well, with certain exceptions. Once you get a planet, you're stuck with it. Hmm. And, of course, Pluto is one of the exceptions. Right. And so, um, I know this is a huge question, but before we dig into details, so Mm -hmm. you're kind of painting this picture, not kind of, you are painting this picture of a cosmos that is interacting with human consciousness and Mm -hmm. molding human consciousness. Um, I don't know if Mm -hmm. evolving is correct. Like I talked to Mark Stavish a while ago and he, yeah, he, he, he corrected me on the use of the term evolution of consciousness. So now I'm, I'm wary. (laughs) I now I'm wary of using the term. (laughs) So, um, that, that sounds like Mark. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so whatever the terminology is, there is like a change, a progression, a mutation, mm-hmm. whatever it is. What mutation is? is a, it's a good word. Go on. Okay. Okay. Mutation. And so, what is the what is the end goal of it? Like, what is it trying to tailor us towards? Well, it may not be heading any in any particular direction at all. Okay. What one of the so. I'm gonna I'm gonna fuss about the word evolution here for a moment. Okay. So, All right. Please do. Please do. You know, kind of building on. Um, the, I I I would love to make everyone who uses the word evolution sit down and actually read Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, because everybody thinks that evolution means progress. Everyone thinks that evolution means getting better towards some goal. No, that's not what it means. Evolution is just adaptation to change. Hmm. If you look, well, here, here's a good example. Um, you go into the meadow right now, and you, if, you're, if you sit quietly, you'll probably see a field mouse, a field mouse, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, if you sat in that meadow, let's say you have a time machine, you have about 50 million years, you sit in that meadow, you'll see something else that's not a field mouse. But you know what? It's just as good as at the same job of, you know, eating grass seeds and so on as a field mouse. Okay, get back in your time machine, go another 50 million years, you're in the time of the dinosaurs. There's a little bitty reptile going along there eating grass seeds. Well, it's not grass seeds. Grass hadn't evolved yet, but it's eating seeds off the ground like a field mouse. It's doing the same job just as efficiently. It's not about things getting better. Hmm. It's just about the adaptation to change. Now, most people can't hear that because the idea of progress is the the great mythology of our time. It is is the religion of our society. People believe in progress nowadays the way medieval peasants believe in, you know, the wonder-working bones of St. Edelford. Um, progress is our talisman. Progress is our hope of the future. And the mere fact that we've, you know, completely monkey-wrenched the history of, of humanity to make it look like we're progressing, uh, because that's what we believe, because that's our myth, that's our, our justification, um, it never sinks in. So I know most of the people who listen to this will not hear this and will not realize that evolution isn't going anyplace. Hmm. But nonetheless, I'm going re- I'm going to reiterate that. What's happening to us as a species, as planetary influences change, influences rise and fall, does not have to go someplace. One of the great lessons of astrology, the planets move in circles, well actually ellipses, but they're they're close enough. They don't go in straight lines, they're not headed towards some goal. They're just looping through these great cycles of the heavens. So are we. Um, Human beings. As individuals, we're born, we grow up, we do things with our lives, we get old, we die. If spiritual traditions are to be believed, we then repeat the process. <clears throat> um, civilizations, they're born, they rise, they flourish, they get old and creaky, they fall. And then new civilizations rise in their place. It's not a straight line. It's not going anywhere. Hmm. So. What's happening with the planets as planets fade in, as planets fade out? Um, there are various speculations as to what the purpose of it is, but it doesn't seem to be moving in any kind of straight line toward any one goal. Maybe it's just it, the, the, the Hindus have this idea of lila, the idea that existence is a dance or a game. It doesn't have a point to it. It's just it's play. Hmm. And maybe that's you know maybe that's the you know the planets are just planets are just dancing. They're they're dancing around. Their influences are showing up here and showing up there as they spin this way and spin that way and you know they, they're calling us to take part in the dance but that doesn't mean that it has to go other than just dancing hmm. 
Yeah, that, that's a that's a wild thought. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, I've encountered it before. Um, I mean, not not precisely how you phrased it, but you know, the general idea that looking but for a general idea, yeah, it's out there. Right, right, and um, yeah, I don't. I'll be honest. It's it's. I instinctively rebel against that. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, yeah. It's just. I, I guess the big question is morality, right? Like morality. Yeah, everybody in modern industrial society has been programmed to think of progress, of marching ahead in a straight line from the caves to the stars. That again, that's our that's our mythology, that's right. our belief system. It's our religion. Um, I'm a heretic. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, no, I think it's just um, for me. Uh, honestly, and, and I just go into this real quick before we'll get into Pluto. But um, because because I feel like this is a thought that a lot of people have, and I'm really interested on in your perspective on it. For me, the thing that I find myself instinctively reacting to the most when I consider the idea that there is no like end goal or point to it is like I look at the people that I love in my life, and I don't like I don't like thinking of them as just like oh yeah they're just going to disappear and then it's just over and it, it was really just all kind of pointless. Um, I know for me personally, I, well, I feel anyway, as well as a person can know their own mind, um, that, that is what bothers me about that idea. Okay. Yeah. Well, well think, think of it this way. Um, when I mean, you're spending time with somebody you care about, right. there isn't necessarily a goal to it other than spending time with people you care about. That is very true. You know, you're sitting around, sitting around on, a, on a Saturday morning with, with breakfast, to, you know, um, breakfast cooking and, and everyone's just kind of hanging out and having a good time. There's no goal to it. There's no purpose to it. Maybe the universe is like that. Hmm. That is that is very true. That is true. And um, it's interesting that some of us, such as myself, seem to be programmed with this need to feel there's a purpose to it. But <laughs> it, there was there was a guy years ago. This is um, around the the early years of the 20th century. There was a guy named Oswald Spengler who had this. About how different civilizations each have their own basic vision of the world, their own basic understanding of the point of life, and so on and so forth. And the civilization that we belong to, the one that got started in Europe um, and spread to, of course, North America and various other places, um, its basic idea is infinite extension, heading out in a straight line to forever. Hmm. Um, we are the only culture, in, we're the only civilization in history that ever used linear perspective in our art. You really? You've got that straight line extending out to everywhere. Huh. And so he would go, and so this is, this is how we're into our culture. So that, you know, it's no problem. It's just, just be aware that it's a cultural habit and that we'll see how well it actually bears up to reality. <laughs> Yeah, that that is that is a fascinating insight, and I will be contemplating that. But all right, so I kind of derailed things a little bit, um, or took us on a, a took us on a side path. So let's get back to Pluto. So yeah, so you've gone over the general thesis of the the planetary influence on human consciousness. Um, let's get into Pluto a little bit specifically. Okay. Okay. So Pluto. Let's start with Pluto. Pluto. Um, again, I talked about how. Neptune was discovered because there were these wobbles in the orbit of Uranus. Well, there were wobbles in the order of Neptune, in the orbit of Neptune also, and also the Neptune himself did not actually explain all the wobbles in the orbit of Uranus. Hmm. So by about 1900, people were going, okay, there's got to be another planet out there, and there was an organized search. And it started right about 1900, people really just really piled in. Thank you. 
something that can hurt. You can watch all of these plutonium factors come into play. Uh, for example, one example, nuclear fission, the splitting of the atom. Um, it was first hypothesized a little before 1930, I think it was 1898, or no, 1900, a little before 18, uh look before 1900, it was 1898, I think, that it was first speculated that that's what radioactivity was. But, so, and then, then um, not long after 1900, you had Einstein with his famous equation, E equals MC squared. You have the realization that if you can shatter an atom, it will release fantastic amounts of energy. And so, not long after 1930, they succeeded in it for the first time, and then uh, shortly thereafter, the first nuclear reactor was built, and shortly thereafter, two cities in Japan got turned into smoke. Uh, so, Pluto arrived with a bang. Hmm. In the same way, um, in 1900, you had Sigmund Freud, the psychologist, writing his book on the interpretation of dreams, which is generally thought to be sort of the first major marker of what was called in the day the psychoanalytic revolution. And here he was splitting something too. He wasn't splitting the atom, he was splitting the mind. It's the conscious and subconscious half. It's the ego and the id, as he called them. And they were again releasing sexual energy. And so you had, um, the, the interesting thing here being is the word atom literally means something you can't divide, apomos in Greek. Individual in Latin means something you can't divide. Hmm. In Individuum. So we had Einstein predicting the splitting of the atom and Freud predicting the splitting of the mind very nearly, you know, right at the same time <laughs> as Pluto comes in. And then this whole thing builds into a major social, and in the case of the atomic power of technological force, over that 30 year period. Um, there were other things that happened space travel. Um, the idea of traveling, traveling in outer space, it was one of these, yeah, I suppose so. Um, it was not a big deal up until 1900. I mean, I mean Jules Verne wrote about it, but Jules Verne wrote, what, like 70 novels? <laughs> More than that, two of them were on space travel. Um, H.G. Wells, we all think of H.G. Wells, the great science fiction writer. He wrote all of these books about, you know, amazing technologies, and I think he had two of them also on space travel. It just wasn't that big a deal. But then Pluto comes in, and the idea of Again, splitting, separating ourselves from the planet Earth, building, you know, going to distant worlds or building space stations, traveling through the void, very Plutonian. And so that showed up. You had people theorizing. You had Robert Goddard um, building the first rocket engine um, in the in the run up to the Pluton to Pluto's discovery. You had all of this sort of stuff. The space space travel was hot. Then there was, there was another factor that's really interesting. I mentioned the Communist Manifesto uh, back in 1848. Very Neptunian, very, here is this dream of a perfect world that we can we, we can bring together. Well, well, of course, the way Marx originally said it, we don't have to do anything. It's going to happen naturally. Right. It's, going, it's naturally going to unfold that way. That's a very Neptunian way to think about things. And then as, as, the, as the Plutonian influence built after 1900, you had Vladimir Lenin sitting Switzerland going, no, it's not going to happen to itself by itself. I'm going to build a party. I'm going to take control of existing organizations. I'm going to kill lots of everyone who gets in my way. Right. Um, we're going to seize power, very Plutonian, subversion. And so we have the emergence of revolutionary communism. In 1917, they seized control of Russia. And over the years that followed, leading up to, to 1930, um, to Putin's discovery, um, you have this emergence of something that was not what Marx had in mind at all. You have this this gargantuan tyranny with um, with prison camps all over Siberia, with mass graves, with secret police everywhere. That was not what Marx was talking about. Right. But it's a very Plutonian thing. And so, in the wake of the Second World War, what happened? The world was split in half between the communist world and and, and the capitalist world. So again, we have that image of splitting, that is dividing down the middle, very Plutonian. So there, there are other examples, but those those are really those are really, I think, the best the best example. Well, actually, the one other the one other example I would have to cite is modern art and music, and there the division is between artists and everyone else. Um, the split you have the you I mean up until the nineteen the really the late nineteen twenties, people were still doing art that most people liked. 
Right. The paintings that were winning prizes, the music that was being performed in symphonies, and so on and so on. The architecture, people were going, wow, that's really cool. And then you have that Plutonian influence get in, and you have, on the one hand, um, professional fakers like like um, Andy Warhol, who is basically one of the great conners of the 20th century. <laughs> agreed, I'm agreed. Paint, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint a robot, <laughs> and people are going to give me $2 million for it. <laughs> it was great. John Cage did the same thing in music. Um, and But mostly you had people going, okay, how ugly how incomprehensible, how offensive can I make this? Because that's art. What? But that's Pluto. The Plutonian influence is the influence, it's the rejection of unity, the splitting of unity, the, the plunge into this sort of Plutonian depth where it's all about sex and all about crud and gritty. Hmm. Um, I mean, we could go on. I could talk about the way the detection, detective fiction mutated in the 1930s and all you went from the sort of the, the, the very refined um, Agatha Christie-esque mystery to the gritty private eye mystery of the Raymond Chandler hmm. variety. Kind of the birth of the anti-hero. Exactly. The anti-hero is a, is, is the class, is a classic Plutonian figure. Huh. So yeah, so you have all of these things coming in with Pluto. Now, this is where it gets interesting because there was a lot of, of course, astrology was, was really hitting its stride again. There, astrology comes in and out of fashion, but in the 60s, of course, it really got popular again, and it was really hitting its stride. There were a lot of people writing about Pluto. It was a big deal. Um, a lot, you know, people were watching, very carefully watching, very nervously watching their Pluto aspects and so on, because a transit across your natal Pluto, your life would blow up. Hmm. And... And then it started to fade. And this is where it gets really interesting because it, that happened in astronomy first. When Pluto was originally hypothesized, when people were, were first starting that search, because of the gravity, the, the, wibble, the wibbles and wobbles in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, they figured, okay, this is another planet about the size of Neptune. It's like eight times the size of Earth. It has to be to provide that much gravity. But when they discovered it, when, when Clyde Gombaugh spotted the photo, spotted the, the little movement in the photograph, when other astronomers turned their their, their telescopes on um, on Neptune, on Pluto, rather, they were going, no, this is too small. How small is it? Well, we didn't have really good ways of measuring the size of something that far away back then, but they were able to figure, okay, at most it's the size of the Earth. So, okay, it's the size of the Earth. And every year that passed, every new measurement came in, it got smaller and smaller and smaller. Finally, we got satellites out there. And that was the thing. Once you get a satellite, if you can put a satellite in orbit around something, the track of the satellite's orbit is just controlled by the gravity of what it's orbiting. You, it's like plopping a planet on a bathroom scale. Hmm. You know exactly how big it is. And so they were going, oh, crap. This Pluto is like one-seventh the size of Earth's moon. It's tiny. It's like one-four hundredth the mass of, the mass of Earth. Hmm. Okay. And so, in fact, it, the, the decline had been so steady that in the, 19, in the 1980s, some, some a couple of wags published something in, a, in an astronomical journal saying, you know, if this continues, um, sometime soon Pluto will cease to exist. Because they did a graph, you know, it was this size, this size, this size, gradually declining. <laughs> And they just drew a line through the graph and said, okay, here's where it hits zero. And they were <laughs> off by a few years. <laughs> but yeah, it, it turned out, first of all, it was tiny. And it was so tiny that it didn't even it didn't even have enough gravity to clear the space around it of other pieces of floating space junk, which is one of the basic definitions of a planet. A planet is big enough to do that. Hmm. And so that was what led ultimately to that decision at the International Astronomical Union in 2006 when they sat down and they told it, Pluto is not a planet. It doesn't qualify. Now, let's look at the things we were just talking about, okay? We were talking about space travel. I don't know how many people even remember the incredible hopes and, and um, assumption, bland assumptions of, of course, this is going to have to pile on space travel back in the day. Oh, you know, we're going to the stars. Um, by the year 2000, there will be cities on the moon, there will be bases on Mars, we'll be mining the asteroids, 
And then we actually tried it. And it turned out that, you know, on the one hand, space travel is expensive. Right. It's insanely expensive. And it doesn't provide anything much in return. You know, yeah, we can put some boot prints on the moon. The U.S. was dropping like 15% of its, of its total national budget into space travel in the Apollo years. Wow. That's how much it cost. And, and what were you getting from it? Some rocks. Okay, they were interesting rocks. They kept scientists really intrigued. I think they're still being studied. But we got some rocks. <laughs> and, um, and, of course, then it turned out, once we started doing planetary probes out beyond the magnetosphere, the, the Earth's magnetic field, that deep space outside of the magnetosphere is full of hard radiation. We've got this huge, unshielded fusion reactor at the center of the solar system. We call it the sun. It's pumping out hard radiation. You can go to the moon and back and not take too much of a hit. Um, to get to Mars, that's a nine-month journey by spacecraft. Your likelihood of getting there, staying there, and coming back without ending up really sick or possibly dead of cancer is not good. Hmm. People have been trying not to talk about this ever since it was discovered in the mid-1970s, but that's why the United States and the Soviet Union both dropped their manned space program at that point. I mean, we had plans to go to Mars. The Russians had plans to go to Mars. The Chinese were actually talking about it. And then all of a sudden, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to, we're going to, lo- we're going to orbit some space stations under the magnetosphere, oh, in low Earth orbit, where it's safe, more or less. But all of a sudden, that went away because... The more we learned about the solar system, the more we learned that it's completely inhospitable to human beings. Hmm. I mean, people talk about living on Mars. You are, you know, you are much better off living in Antarctica or in the Gobi Desert or on top of Mount Everest. Right. Okay. These are more hospitable environments than the nicest place on Mars. And of course, if you're in one of these other places and something goes wrong, help is not nine months away. <laughs> so, and so, so the thing is, space travel turned out to be a white elephant. It turned out to be this grandiose dream that just kind of trickled away into slow failure. And people are still clinging to it. People are clinging to the fantasy, even though we know better now. Nuclear power, exactly the same thing. Um, in the 1950s, Eisenhower was, you know, launched the first American nuclear reactor that was going to produce power for citizens, um, atoms per, for peace, blah, blah, blah. It was going, the, the, the idea was, you know, that electricity was going to literally become too cheap to meter. You'd, you'd, um, you'd simply have a, a hookup fee of like three bucks a month and mm-hmm. could use all the power you wanted. That was the claim. The reality is that nuclear power is too expensive for anyone to use. No nation on earth has been able to maintain the nuclear power industry without gargantuan government handouts to the nuclear industry. Hmm. And most countries that do it, do it because they're stockpiling, they're, they're, they, have a, they have nuclear weapons and they want the plutonium. But, and so they're, they're kind of paying for that and saying, okay, well, why don't you make us some electricity while you're at it? Hmm. Uh, that's how France does it, for example. Um, but but as, a, as a source of power for the electricity grid, again, it's a gargantuan overpriced white elephant. Um, you have to, you should just, you have to shovel money down a rat hole, and it never gets better. So that turned out that way. Um, we can talk about communism. Same thing. In the 1930s, the 1940s, into the 1950s, communism looked like the, the wave of the future. It was expanding. It was metastatic. It was aggressive. It was powerful. And it ground to a halt, and we all got to see what it actually looked like, which was constant corrosive economic failure. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And Marx's economics just don't work. When you try to apply them to the real world, they don't work. Um, you know, the system we've got has a lot of problems, I mean, don't get me wrong, but at least it more or less functions, and socialism doesn't. Right. <laughs> and, so, and so that's the, you know, that's the situation, again, it turned out to be a gargantuan white elephant, a dream that arrived with a bang and faded out with a whimper. Hmm. As we saw in 1991, when the Soviet Union came unraveled, just no, no, no fighting, just kind of, oh, wow, it's gone. Right, right. <laughs> and and, and the thing, modern art is in the middle of doing that right now. Um, it's reached the point that no, 
not even the collectors, not even the, the patrons can even stand the stuff. <laughs> you know, you, you make you make this modern sculpture, and it looks like it looks like your dog you know, <laughs> ate some awkward things and threw threw up on it. Right. Um, you know, and you, you kind of mounted it up there. There's your sculpture. Okay, you made your sculpture. You got it. You got an MFA from a good art school. You're you're a top notch artist. You get this thing, and it's picked up by a third rate museum and. You know, it might be shown for two weeks and then it's stuck in a warehouse, and you might get it. It might be coming out sometime in the next twenty years. Hmm. Nobody can stand the stuff. Right. Uh, where, where I live in Rhode Island, we have a we have a big art museum in Providence, which is um, attached to the Rhode Island School of Design, and they've actually had, they, they've been desperately trying to get people to look at modern art, to get to the good stuff, to get to the the, the pre Plutonian art. You literally have to walk through this gallery of modern art. <laughs> <laughs> and you watch people just sort of with their head down, trying not to look at the ugly crap around them. Well, they make a beeline through it to the elevator to we'll get them to Baroque paintings and Egyptian art and, and Asian art, all these, all these stuff that's actually, that's actually attractive. Mm-hmm. And in the same way, um, the symphonies these days have learned that if, if you want anybody to attend, you don't do modern music. If it, if it was composed during the 20th or 21st century, if that's all that's on your program, you will have the advantage of playing to an empty house. And they've, had to, they've learned also that if you do your program, you have the good stuff toward the end because people will sit through it, sit through the bad stuff first, and then, then you get to Beethoven or whoever. Hmm. If you put your Beethoven first and then you end with some 20th century stuff, people will get up at the intermission and walk out. It's that bad. Right. And so it's guttering out right now. We, we have the first real signs of a resurgence of, dare I say it, real art. Art that doesn't make you want to barf. And art that actually has some craftsmanship, some skills, and vision, and music likewise. Um, it's picking up again. And so the Plutonian, you know, the, the Plutonian influence there, again, is just sort of trickling away in failure. So we see once again this pattern in the heavens resulting in echoing being mirrored by a pattern on earth so would you would you say that pluto had and of course i know this is you know this is relative um to each individual but also just to you know our perspective as a species but would you say that there was anything that could be called beneficial or positive from pluto's influence oh sure oh sure um i think i think that there was you know pluto was a balancing factor um freudian psycho psychotherapy was absolutely necessary when it happened Think of, think of the Victorian period. You know, think of the period where the thought of actually admitting that the nice people had sexual desires was unspeakable. And there was a disease, we now call them conversion disorders, back then it was called hysteria, where people would, mostly women, because women were, were pressured so heavily to pretend that they had no sexual desires at all, hmm, right. they would literally wig out if they caught them, you know, if they noticed they were sexually aroused by something. There was a common thing called glove anesthesia. It's a situation where one of your hands goes limp and numb. Okay? It's not neurological because that's not the way the nerves go. But from starting at the you know, from the wrist out, glove anesthesia was very common. It was caused by masturbation. Um, young women would masturbate, would, would become so aroused, they'd masturbate, then be so horrified by guilt that they'd wake out and their hand, they'd Psychologically, they just withdraw all attention from their hand, and their hand would go numb. Wow, that, that was common. Um, or you'd get a situation where a woman was out in the park and saw a scantily dressed man, say a groom, um, at the horse, and got the hots for him, and was so shocked by that that she was terrified of going to the park ever since. She'd have this phobia about the park because she couldn't let herself think. Because I mean, having sexual desires meant you were an awful person. It meant you were going to fry in hell for all eternity just because you had the desire. Wow. That was the ideology at the time. It was crazy. And so here's Dr. Freud who says, oh, glove anesthesia, yeah, you've been masturbating. <laughs> <laughs> and then this got published, and everyone, and it reached the point that if you had glove anesthesia, everyone, everyone around you was going, oh, I see somebody been masturbating. <laughs> you couldn't maintain the hypocrisy anymore. It crashed to the ground. People got more realistic about the fact that human beings are sexual creatures. We have sexual desires. Whether or not we choose to act on them is one thing, but we have the desires deal. Right. And that's a Plutonian thing. The, the, re, the reveal.
Healing the unspeakable is very Plutonian. And so in, in getting rid of Victorian hypocrisy and making it possible for everybody to just accept the fact that, yeah, you know, we are what we are. We are sexual beings, whether what we do about that is, is another thing. But yeah, if you see an attractive person of the opposite sex and you happen to be, you know, what have you, you're going to feel it. Deal, that doesn't make you an evil person, it just makes you human. Right. Pluto made that realization possible. And for that, we should all be grateful to Pluto. Right. And so, so now, I, I totally agree with that last statement. So... Now, as Pluto is exiting um, its its influence, will the like the effects that it had, the things that it implanted into our consciousness or, or introduced to our consciousness, will they linger, or will it just completely disappear at some point? Well, this this is the thing. Pluto is, did not go away. Pluto was downgraded from planet to dwarf planet, right? From, from a major factor to a minor factor, but that category of dwarf planet matters it's not it's not a, it's, it's not just you know pluto wasn't just turned into an asteroid or something um and meanwhile it's also worth noting that series we men, i mentioned her earlier and we we'll want to get to that in a bit series was promoted from asteroid to dwarf planet because you know she's another big round um large enough to be spherical etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think they, they there's at least one more they know of eris who's further out and there are a couple more that are currently in, in debate as to whether they are in fact dwarf planets. So what, ha- what we have is a set of, of minor influences, but they're, they're not negligible. They're just, they're less important than they were. Hmm. Um, I have noticed in, in um, natal charts that I've done, for example, that a dwarf planet, if it's strongly placed in the chart, can actually have a significant effect on someone's life. Um, series again, um, um, what, what, do, what do we do? Why don't, why don't I run through the story of Ceres? Because that's kind of important. Yes, well. please do. Okay, so Ceres was discovered in, in 1801, was, was thought to be a planet the way Pluto was. Um, and by about 1850, it was clear that Ceres was not a planet, that it was simply the largest of the asteroids. And so Ceres was downgraded. Now, there was this entire movement, which was called Romanticism, that emerged about 30 years before Ceres was discovered and faded out about 30 years afterwards. The, the, this whole romantic movement, there was romantic literature, romantic poetry, romantic politics, there's even a romantic style of chess playing. It was a major cultural factor. And after Ceres was um, demoted to asteroid status, left the planet, a lot of the works of romanticism became completely incomprehensible to most people. Hmm. <laughs> Although minor power in the cosmos. 
And that's in, the series is important here partly because she went through the same arc of Pluto's discovery, identification as a planet, de, um, demotion from planetary status. And now, if you look at Sirius, Sirius is the, is the dwarf planet of, of nourishment, of, of nurturing. Hmm. Um, she has to do with feeling nurtured or not feeling nurtured, with um, feelings of isol- isolation and abandonment or feelings of you know, being, being drawn in and held, if you will. And watch, if, if you find a natal chart where Ceres is very strongly placed, they conjunct with another important planet or um, on one of the angles, on the, the, the ascendant, descendant, midheaven, or nadir, um, very often she's a significant factor. There's one that I mention in the, um, well, one, one person who I mention in the book, who um, she, has, she has Ceres very strongly placed in her chart. It's, it's right on, it's basically right on the ascendant and also conjunct Venus. And, and so she had, she had an abusive parent who starved her. She's always had a complicated relationship with food. She's the kind of person who reads cookbooks for pleasure. <laughs> wow. Because they make, they, because they make her feel, feel nurtured. They make her, you know, she can imagine cooking and eating the food and all this kind of stuff. Hmm. And so it's, you know, it's all very straightforward. Um, and Whereas you look at other charts where Ceres is not strongly placed and they don't have any of those issues at all. So I expect Pluto to be a similar kind of thing. A minor planet, not negligible, but not a full planetary status. And if you have in a natal chart, let's say, if you have Pluto rising or Pluto in your midheaven or Pluto contract your natal sector or something like that, you're going to feel it. Whereas if Pluto is just kind of nowhere, you're not. So on the broader sense, I expect the various factors we've talked about, you know, uh, rockets and um, nuclear physics and revolutionary political theory and economic theories and so on, I expect those to continue as a kind of low-level factor, occasionally popping into prominence. Um, you know, when, whenever a planet, whenever, you know, a planet um, conjuncts Pluto, there may be a Plutonian effects in the world, hmm. and so on and so forth. It's just... It's not an it's not an erasure. It's just a it's just a downgrading in, in intensity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's it. So, all right. In this this evolution, I keep using this word evolution. In this, um, go ahead. No, 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 no. Because you and ahead, you you add, and Mark are. No. What was adaptation, that? Adaptation. Adaptation to change. It's, it's a perfectly fine. Okay. Word. Okay. Go okay. Ahead. Well, no. Just uh, you you and Mark both definitely have me thinking about that and I do want to be more careful with my thinking but in this case I think actually evolution is what I'm saying uh-huh. so in this course of evolution as these influences come in and come out we still have is it the would you say it's the big five the ones that you know they were the original well not the you know what I mean they were well, the older planets count, counting, the, counting the sun and the moon also it's the big seven big seven and big seven. then and then these days with, because you're right and Neptune aren't going anywhere they're they are planets. They are, they're big. <laughs> I mean, um, what is it? Neptune's like eight times the size of the Earth, and Uranus is a little bigger. Right. But they're, they're, hefty, they're big, hefty planets. And their influences remain with us. We're still, you know, we, we've still got um, technology. We've got science fiction. We've got, um, we've got eccentricity. We've got drug abuse. Um, that's Neptune. But then we have all these Neptune influence also. So I think we've got those nine for the long term. Okay. And the the influences that they have, obviously, um, your book is about the influence on human consciousness and all the various um, outsprings of human consciousness. But does it affect the Earth as well? Like the actual um, planet? Certainly the theory of astrology is yes, it does. Okay. If you get into esoteric astrology, the idea is that each planet is actually the body of, of a conscious being. And when people talk about Mother Earth, the, in esoteric astrology, that is, that's a reality. There is a consciousness of the whole planet, you know, which barely notices us. I mean, how much do you notice the bacteria on your kneecap? <laughs> right. Uh, and, but, but yeah, so these planetary things, the, the, the influences that are affecting us are, are, a small, are, are a small echo of these vast shifts in the relationship between these great planetary consciousnesses. And so, yeah, the Earth as a whole is being affected in Hmm. 
And so, all right, you were, you, when you were talking about the influence of Pluto, um, you mentioned, well, you, it's all about the splitting, the division, etc. And now we're in this period as Pluto is beginning to wane. Um, but we are in a time of extreme division, um, uh -huh. ideological and political, and just, just really everything. I mean, everybody's feeling very divided. So... I don't know, where do you think that falls in this, this path of Pluto as it's fading out and we're living through this time of extreme you know, uncertainty, uh, division, etc.? Okay, the thing that I see, first of all, is that Pluto, one of the things that we, see, that we can see with all of the Plutonian phenomena is that people cling to the Plutonian energy even as it's falling out from beneath them. There are still lots of people placing all their hopes on nuclear power. Right. There are still lots of people placing all their hopes on socialism or on space travel. Right? There might even be some people who are so all obsessive about Freudian psychotherapy. Um, and so there's this tendency for people to cling to the echo, even as it fades out. Hmm. A lot of what's going on in society today, a lot of the apparent division, is very clearly being whipped up by the media. Right, absolutely. And if you actually when people actually like get together and talk a lot of times they find they have a lot less separating them than the media wants them to think i've watched this happen over and over again right um and so we have that sort of plutonian influence still sort of hanging on but just as there's a 30-year period of phasing in there's a 30-year period of phasing out we saw hmm. that with series and in a couple of other examples planets that were discovered and then turned out not to exist at all that's happened a couple of times now um, but so Pluto was downgraded into in 2006 so we'll have until around 2036 before the process has more or less finished last year was the halfway point man last that is point. that is fascinating because I you know I I pay attention to the um, the rates at which people watch corporate media or mainstream media, however people want to uh -huh. say it, old school media, legacy media, whatever, versus uh -huh. um, independent media. And it has been slowly but steadily less – people are tuning out to the old school uh -huh. corporate media and people are tuning uh -huh. in to independent media. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Years. Right. I mean, just, at this point, you know, someone like Joe Rogan is, is talking to millions of more people than tuned into CNN. And the thought, you know, 15 years ago, that was just unthinkable. And yet, here's this guy who's just posting stuff to YouTube. Um, exactly. So yeah, there's we're, we're seeing we're seeing the fading out of of these Plutonian influences. And I expect to see more of that. I expect to see that pick up as we go. And as various, you know, the, the, the grip of the Plutonian energy just sort of slackens, and it'll trickle out. I don't expect to end with a boom. Plutonian things never seem to. They start with a bang and end with a whimper. And so, you know, I, did, I imagine so 2036, um, when, say, CNN finally shuts down, if right. it lasts that long, okay, they finally shut down, you know, they have the last, their last episode. They have um, a few thousand people watching. Man, that is, yeah. I, I, I honestly, I'm just, I, I, I really they love that. The, they yeah, they reach the point where they can no longer find anyone to advertise with them because their market is too small, and so they pull the plug. That's the kind of thing that I would expect to see happening as a result of, of the sort of waning of Pluto. And in the same way, I don't, I expect to see nuclear power plants just gradually mothballed one at a time, no big we're shutting it all down, just uh, we can't get any more spare parts for that because nobody's making them because there isn't enough on a market for nuclear power plant parts anymore, or what have you and just one by one each of these things fading out into um, in, into nothing and, and the world picking up and going on doing other things and frankly the sooner that happens no, I, I, yeah, I absolutely now, agree because I, I have also I, I witnessed can, the division yeah, that they I, I could. Say, I have not owned a television in my adult life. Right. I'm never going to. I, you know, I have a life. I don't need a television. <laughs> right. And so, um, and, and in fact, I, I want to encourage our listeners to think do you really want to spend you know, four to six hours a day with drool puzzling on your lap watching that? You could, you could like, do something useful, have a life, or have, do something interesting. 
Right. I don't know, that's my little that's my little pet rant. <laughs> 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 no, I agree. I, I can actually lay claim to the same thing. I've never purchased the TV hey. for myself. Yeah, in my adult life. I have purchased them for other people, but not for myself. But, um, yeah. okay, so how about currency? Right, There's all this stuff going on with cryptocurrency and, um, uh-huh. and just in, in general. I mean, the petrodollar now, there's a very real chance the petrodollar could be knocked down. So If that happens, um, <laughs> we are going to see some economic convulsions on the Right. Have you have you looked any time recently at a chart? Hello. 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 Okay. There's something beep got me. Um, a little beep. It went like that. Huh. Um. Okay. Apparently, I don't know. Does someone not like me? To what? <laughs> I heard it again. Uh, Effort all. Right. I didn't get it. Okay. <laughs> Funny. Um. At any rate, if you look at a chart of the money supply. Is it, it, John, is it still beeping at you? No, it stopped. Okay, okay. Are we still recording? Yeah, we are. Okay, good. So, at any rate, you look at the Ed chart at the M2 money supply in the United States in the 1960s to present, and it's a, it's a parabolic curve. It starts rising slowly, and by 2020, it's going vertically. They're mass-producing money, spinning the presses at an insane rate to try to stave off national bankruptcy because the United States, our economy has become so corrupt, so dysfunctional, right. that only constant dumping of trillions of, do- of, of made-up dollars can keep it afloat. If the petrodollar goes pop, or if any of half of the fun of the things, I mean, this is not a sustainable process. And so one of two things is going to have to happen. Either we get hyperinflation of the Weimar Republic or Zimbabwe variety, or the U.S. defaults on its debt. Hmm. Both. And so, you know, we're facing gargantuan economic shifts. Cryptocurrency, I think that the blockchain technology has a lot of potential, but watching the way the cryptocurrency has been bid up, um, it's, it's very speculative. And I am far from sure that it is worth what it, what's currently being charged for it. We'll see. I could be wrong. I'm not a, I'm not a specialist in the field, right. but I've heard a lot of hype and a lot of, Buy now so you can sell in a year or twice, you know, the, the same kind of thing we heard from every other speculative bubble in the last 25 years. Um, and I just, I have my, I have my doubts. I want to, I want to see it prove itself over the long term. I want to see it prove itself through a couple of serious recessions hmm. before I'm going to say, okay, cr- yeah, cryptocurrency is a real option here. Okay. Um, so, all right. This is going to be kind of a big question, and uh, I, I'm almost hesitant to pin it on you. But so I listen to a lot of people like you know Austin Kapolke, Gordon White, and a lot a lot of folks like that. They have a pretty grim view for the relatively near future, like the next couple of decades, kind of this totalitarian, dystopian type of view. Uh-huh. And um, I'm curious. Generally, I'm not asking to make predictions because that wouldn't be right to put you on the spot like that. But generally, when you're you know looking ahead to your own life. What are you kind of forecasting? What are you kind of seeing, uh, planning for, expecting? Okay. Um, I think the people who are thinking in terms of a techno dystopia have, have failed to take into account the role of incompetence <laughs> in government, in, in historical affairs. Okay. Um, the current ruling class of America and of much of Europe. They, many things can be said about them, but one cannot say that they can find their butt in the dark with both hands. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we have had one round of stunning stupidity after another. And they never learn from their mistakes. At this point, we have a situation building in the world where the United States and Europe are busy. I mean, the, the one absolute necessity of American foreign policy for the last 40 years should have been driving a wedge between Russia and China. Okay? Right. China has all of this technological potential. Russia has all of these resources. If the two of them are allies, they're more powerful than any other, in, any other nation or any other alliance of nations on Earth. Um, Richard Nixon, love him or hate him, many people hated him, he had the, bra- he had the brains to try to play China off Russia to make up with China, to establish good relations, to drive a wedge between those two nations. And it could have been done. It could have been kept up with. We could have 
fight them against these, but we're not doing that. We're doing the opposite of that. All of the stuff around the the Russo-Ukraine war and all of the various things that led up to it, the eastward expansion of Yale and so on, have driven those two countries into each other's arms. Now we're busy driving Iran and India into the same alliance by threatening sanctions. Come on, Iran has, has fantastic amounts of oil and actually a pretty good industrial plant. These days. India is one of, the rising, one of the world's rising powers. We're creating an alliance of forces we cannot overcome. And anybody who had the brains the gods gave geese would have known better to do that. So I look at our, at, at our ruling elites in Washington, D.C. and in Brussels and say, they've got rocks in their heads. Right. So I, don't, so I do not see a dystopia. What I expect to see happening over the next couple of decades is the current, the existing order of society in the United States and Britain um, slamming into one pothole after another until the wheels fall off. Hmm. And one, I mean, we've had a, we've had a few crises recently. Have you noticed? <laughs> there will be more. Right. Um, the the shortages that that are um, that, that are boiling up all over the place. The uh, spikes in the price of oil and other resources economic troubles, people walking off their jobs because, you know, corporate uh, jobs are treated, people in corporate jobs are treated so miserably, Um, all on and on and on. It's just, it's reached the point, it's reached the breaking point. And we are in a situation where I expect the current hosts of power to lose power, whether that happens peacefully by way of elections, whether it happens violently by way of a revolution or a coup d'etat. I don't know. But I expect to see um, a decade or two of really sharp economic and political turmoil, after which I expect things to stabilize and um, whether they are particularly, um, I, I don't know, you know, whether we end up with a democracy or not is an interesting question. I, hmm. I can't settle that in advance, but I don't see it. The, the problem with techno-utopia is that A, it's too expensive. Right. To have all, the, the, the EC, that was the problem with East Germany. You know, they were, they have like a quarter of the population spying on the rest of Right. Not everyone else. It bankrupted them. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we could have this techno utopia with, you know, cameras watching everybody. And um, first of all, every hacker on the planet would be getting into those databases and messing with them. <laughs> Just for the fun of it. Right, and people right. would be doing it. It would be corrupt. It would be riddled with errors. It would grind to a halt in no time flat because that kind of control freak system. You can only get away with that if you have a relatively uncorrupt, relatively competent government. We don't have one of those. So, so I don't expect the totalitarian thing. What I expect is, is chaos, um, crises, troubles, economic crashes, um, elections going in various weird ways, possible coup d'etat, possible overthrow of governments. Um, one doesn't know. Um, but coming out of the crisis into a period of relative stability on the far side, which if enough of the enough of the nonsense is cleared away, as usually happens in such times, um, could be relatively pleasant. Hmm. Okay. And so as now, we... What, oh, please go ahead. Please go ahead. No, so, that, so that's, that's more or less what I'm foreseeing. I'm foreseeing a, you know, um, great living in grubby times, as, as a certain series of books used to call it. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the advantages of chaos is if you're nimble and you pay it, and you're paying attention, and most people aren't, of course. But if you're nimble, you're paying attention, you keep an eye out for opportunities and opportunities to help people among other things, you can actually do just fine. Hmm. As long as you don't if you if you staple yourself to the system, it will drag you down. If you keep your feet loose and are ready to maneuver and um, deal with things as they come up, you can be just you can, you'll be okay. Right. Hmm. So go ahead. See, no, yeah, that's that, that's a great answer. Um, so, a, as we are actually, the question I was going to ask is, as we are moving through this, um, how would you suggest people navigate it? But you you just kind of already did that. <laughs> so, um, mm-hmm. well, so, I, have, I, have, I have some other suggestions actually, if you'd like. Them. I I would love to hear them. I'm sure everybody else okay. would as well. Okay. The, the the first thing to keep in mind: this has been one of my catchphrases for the last decade: collapse now and avoid the rush. If we're going to be going through a period of sharp economic contraction, um, political chaos, disruption of supply chains, and so on, 
Um, if you start living now the way you're going to be living at the bottom of the curve, you're going to have a lot of free resources and a lot of free time that will enable you to maneuver effectively. If you try to cling to a lifestyle you will not be able to afford, it could drag you down. But you know, learning to live cheap in style, it, that people used to be good at that. And you can be good at that again. Look through your life at uh, the things that you have because you're supposed to have them, and they don't actually do anything for you. Get right. Them. Look at the expenses you can ditch without actually, um, with, without actually harming yourself, without actually inconveniencing yourself. Ditch them. Um, learn, to, learn to cook for yourself if you don't already do that. And learn to cook cheap. Rice and beans are very tasty. Um, now, I have an advantage here as a writer. Um, every there's the usual curve of a writer's career. You spend your first twenty years eating, you know, eating rice and beans in a garret, and then you actually start making money. <laughs> that's, it certainly worked that way for my for my wife and I. She had the day job for many years. Um, although I support us now just fine. But um, so so I still I mean I still remember how to how, how to how to live poor and be comfortable at it. You can do that. Hmm. Um, you have to be willing to accept that you're going to be making a lot less money at the bottom of the curve than you do now. Get ready for that. Accept that. Work through the necessary psychological stuff. You know. Yeah, you know, people, a lot of people build their, you know, build their identities into their their annual salary or something. What a, what a miserable way to live! But, right. You know what? You, you do you. But basically, yeah, figure out what you can get rid of, what you can do without. Downshift your lifestyle, downscale your footprint, um, learn to live cheap, and as you have, you know, as the money keeps coming in, you then have resources. You can learn some skills. You can make some investments. You can. Um, do things you want to do while they're still available, and so on and so forth. And then you skate through the bottom in good shape, and then as society has as things stabilized on the far side of the crises, you can pick things up again. And if you want to start making a big salary again, hey, give it a shot. Right. That, 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 that's, that's great fine. advice. Yeah, it's actually you mentioned the investments. That's actually for me personally. It's been I've been trying to figure out how the hell to prepare for this in terms of where I'm putting my money. And um, mm-hmm. it's just I mean, when people start talking about the collapse of the petrodollar itself, it's like, dude, I don't know what to do with my money. Like, what do I do with my money right now? I feel like there's no um, positive option. Well, okay. The first, the first thing I, I do have some suggestions here too. The first thing to do is make sure you have skills. Worst case scenario. If you can provide some, some kind of goods or services that your neighbors desperately need or really want, they're going to see to it that you're taken care of. Right. Okay. Now, the number one recommendation that I have for most people these days, learn to brew good beer. Hmm. Home brewing is easy. Most people can learn it quickly. Most people love their beer. Oh, that is I mean, a if brilliant. A tell, if a tell of a hun rides up to your door and you hand him a cold one, he's going to be your friend. <laughs> that is okay? brilliant, so, man. So this is just one example, but learn some skills and put in the necessary money to to get the training if you need it, to get the gear if you need it. Learn some things, okay? That's thing one for the money. The second thing is get rid of all your debt. Um, Your debt will be used against you and not in a court of law. Um, Get rid of your debt. If you can end up owning a home free and clear, that's a really good investment. Okay. Um, There will still be property taxes and things like that, but if they can't place fancy games with a mortgage or sell it to some Chinese Investor who will uh, you know who will um, play games with the exchange rates or, or 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 that's a good thing to do. Generally speaking, if you can just clear your debts, make uh, get the things you need, that's the first priority. After that, it's a crapshoot. Okay. It's a total crapshoot. Um. So I mean, well, here, here's here's an example from my own family history. Okay. Um. Many a long time ago in a galaxy far far away, actually it was in a small town in eastern Washington. Um, out in the in the farmland out there, there were three sisters who were the let's see, they were the uh, the aunts of my one of my paternal grandfathers. Okay. Okay. And uh, the, uh, no great grandfathers. That's how it goes. Yeah, one of my dad's one of my dad's grandfathers. Um, these three sisters were most of the city bureaucracy of a little town of a, a small city in farm country. One of them was the was the city clerk, and one of them was the city treasurer. And I forget what the third one. And they, they were mainly ladies. They never married. They lived together in a, in a little house there. And in 1929, when stock, 
when stock values crashed, they said, oh, things are cheap now. And they started taking a little of their salary every month and turning and picking up stocks. Now, some of their stocks went absolutely nowhere, but they decided they liked this little startup tech company called International Business Machine. Oh, wow. IBM nowadays. They also found that they could pick up shares of General Motors and U.S. Steel for nine bucks a share or less. Hmm. And so they were building this pile of stocks that were really cheap because everyone thought they weren't going to be worth anything. You know, there's a lot of panic at the bottom of the Depression. And it took a long time for stocks to recover. But when they finally died in the late 1950s, um, they left their money to put um, their younger relatives through college. And I think it was something like 14 young people, including my dad, got wow. a free four-year ride. Because these maiden ladies, there were lots of other bequests to lots of other people, but that's the part that I know about. So, having cash is not necessarily trash. I wouldn't necessarily have it in dollars <clears throat> or in euros, but <laughs> um, have something fungible and um, some, something that, where you can you can make it liquid, something that's relatively liquid, and where you can convert things and look at making investments at the bottom of the curve. Because I don't, the things, I don't expect it to be, so many people are into this idea that there's going to be a crash and it's going to get worse and worse and worse and we're going to end up living in the caves. <laughs> and they're deluding themselves. No. <laughs> the thing is, we're, we're, we're going to see a long, ragged period of depression, contraction, um, changes, lots of stuff going down. I don't imagine we will ever see um, the levels of absurd extravagance and sin that we've that we had in the in the late 20th and early 21st century. I don't think we'll ever see this again. But there will be periods of relative stability and prosperity in the future. So the goal is to get there. And to get there with, you know, if you have if you have investment money, um, keep it liquid um, and <clears throat> keep moving. Hmm. And when you see something that's cheap and might be worth a lot in 20 years, consider putting a little money into it. That's awesome. That is great advice, John. I appreciate that. Um, so, I guess my my well, the last question will be any other projects that you want to talk about. But um, before that, is there anything else on this topic that you would like to explore? Well, look, one of the things about Pluto, the, the, the sort of, and all the Plutonian things, everything Pluto came in with this this thing. It's the wave of the future. Space travel is the wave of the future. Communism is the wave of the future. Hmm. Freudian psychoanalysis is in modern art, please. But no, it's the wave <laughs> of the future. People get caught up in that. They think they know where the future is going. And, the, and what we're seeing now is that the future is blindsiding everybody and saying, no, I'm not going to do that. Oh, yeah. And and coming up being something that nobody expected. It's blindsiding me in some ways. Really? I'm less than, yeah. You know, I mean, I didn't expect the COVID business. Hmm. Um, and I didn't expect, I, for that matter, I didn't expect the Russian the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, I thought I thought that Putin was was you know doing saber rattling bluffing, but you know I I am not I am in no way infallible in this. But um, I collapsed ahead of the Russian who profited from it because I looked at these various waves of the future and said no I don't think so. Um, I. I kept with publishers, for example, I kept with publishers that were still publishing paper books. When everyone's saying, oh, no, no, don't do that. Ebooks are the future. Ebooks are not the future. <laughs> Ebooks are, they're not a flash in the pan. They've, they've developed a market of their own. But but print books are still, come, still coming on strong. Is that is that just so, because people prefer reading them? Or, I mean, is well, there... Partly, it's, partly, it's partly the people, the people like the actual heft of the book. Right. They like the experience. It's not all the sort of and scrolling of letters down the screen. Partly it's because if you own the book, Amazon can't decide to delete it off your Kindle. Right. <clears throat> Partly it's because, um, you know, there's, if you want to read something many times, why don't, why don't get the print version of it? And there, there's all kinds of things. But yeah, um, ebooks have become a thing, but they're not the way of the future. They're just one more market. Right. Um, and, you know, and then, then any useful market at that. You, you know, there's there's a lot of places where you can get out of print books these days, um, done up for Kindle Repub, and it's very convenient. But but so 
also don't get caught in, when you hear people talking about this is the future, this is where we're headed. Um, rule number one: assume that they're wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just, 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 if you hear people, any people, anybody who says, you know, this is the wave of the future, this is the this is the next new thing, they're probably wrong. <laughs> and, but the other, you know, uh, assume that they may, assume that at best they're partly right that it is going to be one of the factors in the future. But um, also be ready for a lot of big, loud things that have been really important and really, you know, this is this dominant thing to trickle away in the Plutonian fashion and just kind of fade out. Hmm. I think a lot of things that um, the people think of as as very much part of everyday life may go that way. We will see if the internet survives. Yeah, I, I was actually going to ask that. that. Yeah, I was going to ask yeah. if you thought the internet was in, in play on this. There's a lot of places in rural America right now where you can't, where you basically can't get decent internet service unless you're willing to pay thousands of dollars. Um, I expect that to accelerate. I expect the internet um, 20 years from now to be something you get in, you get in and around big cities. Hmm. And because it's, it's not the infrastructure to extend it to it. I mean, I imagine you probably get dial-up service. You remember dial-up service? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do. I, my, my first internet connection was, was dial-up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and, but yeah, and then eventually probably going back to, to ham radio BBSs. But we'll see how it goes. But don't assume that just because it's the now thing, it's going to be around in 20 years. Right. So that, I think, is the final the final piece of advice I would leave people. You know, the wave of the... Every wave of the future eventually breaks and rolls right back out to sea. Hmm. Man, all right. Yeah, yeah I... Thank you, John. Uh, I'm stumbling a little bit here because everything that you're saying makes me just want to sit here and contemplate for an hour and stare into space. <laughs> so, well, then, hey, good. Then, I, then I'm doing my job. Oh, dear. Like, you... my, what I'm trying to do here is not to say this is the truth. You should listen to me. I want people to think. Right. My whole job is to kick people in the rump, get them to you know to to get their head and head get the, engage the gears in their brains and think for a change. Don't just believe what the media tells you think about it right well I, I definitely think you accomplished that on this this has been a fantastic uh, conversation I, 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 I sincerely appreciate this and I'm, I'm already looking forward to listening to it again myself um, my last question would be so Twilight of Pluto is out and uh, it's also it's a fantastic book I love the book is there anything else that you are working on or that you would just like to share constantly constantly <laughs> <laughs> um, a good living as a writer is that I'm, I'm always writing something. Um, let's see, what do I have? Um, right now, I'm working, I've got an, another astrology project underway, a book on um, using, basically do, doing certain things, tracking things across your natal chart. Um, that's mostly done, I'll uh, probably be out next year sometime. But yeah, basically using your natal chart as a basis for timing, which is something that will be useful for investors, but also for anybody who is interested in just finding the right time to do things. So that's in process. I expect that to be finished up in a few months and on its way to its publisher. Um, more generally, I've, I've been working for some time on a book on mundane astrology, generally predicting these, basically astrology of political and social prediction. Oh, um, great. It's, it's, a field, it's a field that has been, this is actually, it was neglected very badly for a long time. Um, it has really picked up in recent years, I'm glad to say. Um, I do, I I do through Subscribestar and, and Patreon. I do um, mundane astrology predictions for subscribers, and there's a lot of interest in that. And so this book, which I've actually been issuing to my subscribers a chapter at a time, um, is a guide to how to do it. You know, how to how to read ingress charts, how to read foundation charts, and all the various other things. Hmm. And so those two. Other than that, um, well, I've got some. I got some more fiction underway. I did. I did a few years ago. I did a, a well over a period of some years that is a series of uh, what I call my tentacle novels they're kind of H.P. Lovecraft based yeah. and that was a lot of fun but uh, but that's 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 all slithering off into the into the, into the distance I've got but I've got I've got a couple of fiction projects I'm working on but they're not really that far along yet okay Man, well that, I'm glad I didn't actually know that you had to subscribe sir I will be subscribing because I personally find the mundane astrology to be far more interesting than like my own birth chart or anything I, oh, yeah yeah, so. yeah I agree. I mean, it's, yes, it's nice to look 
your birth chart and but but you know hopefully you know something about yourself already where the old astrology of prediction is so much more useful you're saying okay let's see joe biden's being inaugurated what does the inaugur the day of the inauguration predict right and it's not it's not pretty <laughs> uh, and, and so on <laughs> All right, man. Well, uh, man, thank you so much, John. This has really been fantastic. You're very welcome. And, uh, I've had a good time. Awesome, great, and um, yeah, man. Good luck with Twilight of Pluto, and um, maybe I'll talk to you again soon. I will look forward to it. All right, thank you, John. Bye. Mm-hmm.